Well, I'm going to give you all a minute, but I'm going to start teaching because I have it in my phone. Because I have backup in case we have anything confused back there. Just got to find the right message because I put them all in here. Here we go. That looks like it. The value of your soul. Everybody say the value of your soul. The value of your soul. Now, tonight's Torah portion, guys, as you're going to hear, we're going to be talking about the twins, twinnies. You know, it's kind of neat. I was looking on Facebook, and I was looking at the pictures of my second cousin. Uh, I have two brand new second cousins who are twins. One's a boy and one's a girl. And they are just precious, precious, precious. And uh, I just got to thinking, you know, a lot of times people forget Jacob and Esau. They weren't just brothers. They were twins. Twins. Pretty amazing. And it's funny because when you're looking for drawings or, or pictures of them, um, <clears throat> sometimes they make them look like they're little kids or something. Or they make them with both dark hair. But Jacob definitely had uh, dark hair, and Esau definitely was red in color, red hair. <clears throat> y'all have a hard time, guys? Can y'all not find it? Beautiful. There we go. The value of your soul. So I came up with this picture here, and I really liked it because they have that twin look to them, but one's with the red hair and one's with the, the dark hair as well. And so this is out of the portion Toldot. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we thank you for tonight. We bless you. We love you. I pray, Father, for your precious Holy Spirit to speak to us through the word of God, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would open your word to us, Father. I pray, Lord, that something said, something spoken would bring encouragement, change, and transformation to each of our hearts in Yeshua's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So the introduction tonight is, I'm praying that we'll learn of the absolute dangers of trivializing the inherited blessings of the Lord as Esau did. Now, you may not realize this, but we as believers in Yeshua also have a birthright. We also have an inheritance. We're going to look at that at the end of the message. And it breaks my heart to see Believers sometimes trivialize that, and we're going to talk about that tonight. We'll learn of the believer's spiritual inheritance, emphasizing its importance and encouraging believers to value it. In contrast, Esau's disregard for his birthright. And uh, we're going to look at that tonight as well. Isn't it amazing that you can have such a great inheritance and not recognize it? You know it in your mind, but you don't recognize it in your life, and you trivialize it. Do you know what it means to trivialize something? It means to not give it much credence, to not give it much thought. I want to start with our Torah portion tonight out of Genesis chapter 25, verses 29 through 34. It says, now Jacob cooked a stew. And I'm starting off with the New King James Version, then we're going to, at the end of the message, towards the end, we're going to segue into the Tree of Life version. But this stew, they believe, was red lentil beans. Okay, they don't know for sure, but they believe it to have been red lentil beans. And Jacob cooked this stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. Have any of you ever gone out hunting or fishing for a long day? I'm not much of a hunter, I'm going to be honest with you. I am definitely not an Esau. Um, I tried my hand at hunting twice. And to me, it was the coldest, most boringest thing I've ever done in my life. You can't talk. You just sit there and shiver. You can't really do anything. And you hope that some poor deer will come along and boom. And I'm not against hunting. It's just not my cup of tea. Now, give me a fishing pole and a chair and I'm good to go. And I can fish. So Jacob's cooking this stew. I want you to picture the story out in your mind. And Esau came in from the field. He was weary. He had been hunting. He hadn't caught anything. Couldn't take a piece of the hunt and eat it. So he was hungry. There were no Walmarts. There was no uh, uh, Alons. There was no corner stores. There was no anything for him to eat. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with the same red stew, for I am weary. 
Therefore, his name was called Edom. And Edom, literally, when you look it up, they say they believe it means red. Of course, Esau came out hairy and red, and then he saw this red stew. So between the two of them, they just call him Edom. And Edom became a nation through Esau. And modern day, they believe modern day, where modern day Jordan now exists, was ancient Edom. So pretty interesting there. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Now listen, some fault Jacob for this. I don't fault Jacob for this. I fault Esau. I think God faulted Esau as well. If you have, I'm going to pick on Samuel for a minute. If Samuel has a 2023 Porsche, and Samuel has been out hunting all day, and he comes in, and he's hungry, and he's tired, and he wants a bowl of my homemade red lentil beans, and I say, Samuel, I'll tell you what, I'll sell them to you. He says, for what? I say, for your Porsche. Give me the keys and the title, and it's yours. How many of you think that'd be a bad trade on his behalf? Right? But listen, why do you think that's a bad trade? Because you can picture in your mind a Porsche. When believers can't picture out the incredible inheritance and birthright that they have through Yeshua Messiah, they swap it and trade it for things worse and cheaper than a bowl of beans. Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Esau said, look, I'm about to die. How many of you know young people can be kind of dramatic, right? Was he dying? No. Was he hungry? Yes. How many of you know it takes, they say, about 30 days or so to actually die of hunger? If you ever miss a meal, you will not die. People used to fast for days on end, right? I fasted for seven days one time. It was hard. I won't lie. It was really hard. But I didn't die. Now, you have to drink water. You have to drink in fluids. So was Esau really going to die? No. But how many of you know that the enemy works overtime in our lives, again, to trivialize? He over-dramatizes what's going on in our life to make it look bigger than it really is. And in Esau's eyes, it's like, I'm about to die. What is this birthright to me? What good is this Porsche to me, Bruce? When I'm about to die of starvation, I'll gladly sell it to you for a bowl of those beans. That'd be a bad trade, wouldn't it, Samuel? Bad trade. Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. Well, this was back in the day where a man's contract was his word. You make an oath, that was as good as a written contract. And Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. So there it was. It was red lentils. Then he ate and drank, rose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. We're going to talk about that tonight. How did he despise his birthright? To despise your birthright means to esteem it of such little worth that you're willing to trade it for next to nothing. Samuel was willing to trade the 2023 brand new, beautiful cherry red Porsche to me for a bowl of lentil beans. How many of you think he despised that car? He must not have thought very much of it. He must not have liked it. Why? Because why in the world would you value something and be willing to trade it for a bowl of lentils? Now I'm using a natural analogy to help you understand the significance of what we're talking about. Do you follow me? So Samuel didn't value and doesn't value that Porsche. I value it because I know the real value, right? Esau did not value his birthright. So when it says, of course, this is the translation from the Hebrew that he despised his birthright. It literally means he thought so little of it that he was willing to give it away for nothing. Everybody understand it? Now, this is important for where we're going here. You've got to get that first part. So now I want to flip over to the New Covenant, Mark chapter 8, verse 33 through verse 37. And uh, this is Yeshua speaking. It says, And when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, 
Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what? Follow me. Now, these are the key two verses here. Uh, Verse 33, it says, For whoever desires to save his life will what? Lose it. How many of you think Esau was desiring to satiate, to gratify his immediate desire in that moment, which was, I'm famished, I'm hungry, I need food, and he was willing to sell anything to satisfy that craving. How many of you think that believers, or so-called believers, have cravings and fleshly urges that they want to saturate or satiate themselves with, and they're willing to sell their eternal birthright for a moment's pleasure? A moment's pleasure, and they sell their birthright. We've probably all done it at some point. Thank God for the mercy of God. Amen? But you have to recognize that, repent of it, and recognize, dear Lord, what am I doing? I am selling a Porsche, trading it for a bowl of lentils. I am trading something more valuable than a Porsche. How many of you know that the blessing and inheritance of the Father is so valuable you can't put worth on it. It's so valuable only one thing in the universe was able to pay the price for it, and that was the blood of Yeshua Messiah. That's the value of it. For whoever, verse 35, desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will what? Save it. Verse 36, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? So, well, pastor, how do we go from birthright to losing your soul? I want you to hear me. Your birthright as a believer is eternal life. That is the first and the highest inheritance that we have is that you have been redeemed and given eternal life forever. Through the blood of Yeshua. Someone say amen. amen. Through his death, his burial, his resurrection. What will a man or a woman profit if he gains all of the world, all of the pleasures that the world has, but you lose your eternal life, you lose your own soul? Is there anything a man would trade his soul for? The soul's eternal. Everybody say eternal. Your soul is eternal. It's going to abide forever somewhere at some residency, right? The only hope we have is for that residency to be with Yeshua in eternity through his blood. So why would I, why would you want to despise that by selling out to the world for a moment's pleasure? And you see it all the time. Compromise, that's what compromise is. Everybody say compromise. We need to be men and women of faith who are of no compromise. Everybody say no compromise. No compromise means you're not willing to sell your birthright. You're not willing to trade something far more valuable than Samuel's imaginary Porsche for a bowl of lentils. Did the lentils satisfy Esau for a moment and give him pleasure? Yes, it did. Does sin satisfy and give you pleasure for a moment? Yes, it does. The Bible says sin is pleasure for a season. But the wages of sin is what? Death. But the free gift of God is what? Eternal life. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will, let me ask you this, in Esau's case, they're going to set up the food. What will a man give in exchange for his birthright? Will he give his birthright for a bowl of beans? How does that affect us in our life? We're going to look at that real quick. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food, one bowl of lentils, Sold his birthright. 
Now, what's interesting here, well, I'll get to it here in a second. I want to show you. But read verse 17. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, how many remember Esau changed his mind? Hey, I want that blessing. Jacob, it's his fault. How many of you know we live in the victim age, right? Everything's everybody else's fault. It's never our fault, right? It's his fault. But you know, verse 17, that afterward when he went to inherit the blessing, he was what? Rejected. Everybody say rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. What does that mean? It means it was too late. The deal was done. He had sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. You know, back when I worked um, in the sales business as a young man, very young man, there was something they warned you about. It was called buyer's remorse. And buyer's remorse is somebody would come in and they would buy an expensive item. They'd feel great about it until the next day. And then the next day they'd feel bad, but it was too late. They'd already bought it. So the concept and the idea in sales is to close the deal right there because if you gave people a chance to think about it, most of the time they'd get buyer's remorse and they'd decide not to do the deal. Are you following me? Just an old sales tactic. So it's fascinating here. Esau had seller's remorse. He decided that wasn't such a good deal, but it was too late. Everybody say it was too late. Esau is used as an example of the consequences of godliness and trading eternal blessing for temporal pleasure. Temporal pleasure means temporary pleasure. How many of you know this world only offers temporary pleasure? Sin is only a moment's pleasure, guys. Never forget that. And sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you are willing to pay. It is a danger, a danger, a danger. So Esau here is literally used as the example of the consequences of godlessness and of trading eternal blessing for fulfillment of that momentary pleasure of sin. Why do you think the Holy Spirit, through the writer of Hebrews, references Esau as both a fornicator and profane? Typically, when you read about the word fornicator, in the Hebrew, and we're going to look at the Hebrew word here for fornicator is pornos. We get our English word pornography or porn from it. And how many of you know that's a whole other issue and a big issue? But here he was a fornicator, not in the sense of sexual immorality, but it's used here in the sense, in this context, to describe somebody who's unfaithful or who acts immorally in a broader sense. How many of you know that Esau was literally unfaithful to God? Why? Because he esteemed his birthright so, as being so useless and so worthless, he is willing to sell it for a bowl of beans. So it's fascinating that the Holy Spirit, through the writer of the book of Hebrews, calls Esau profane and a fornicator. Two words. And again, it's not in reference to sexual immorality. It's in reference to immorality because he traded it and decided to be unfaithful to God. A good lesson for all of us, amen? And how many of you know the things in the Old Testament are written as examples for us who are now believers in Yeshua, walking in the Spirit in the New Covenant, amen? Esau's selling of his birthright for a single meal is seen as an act of profound irresponsibility. How many of you would agree with what I wrote there, amen? And failure to appreciate and honor the spiritual and familiar uh, significance, familial significance of the birthright. The birthright was an honor. It was the firstborn. It was something very special, something that should have been treasured one's entire life. Now, we're going to bring this home here to us. <clears throat> this act could be interpreted as a form of spiritual unfaithfulness or immorality. That's why Esau is referenced as a fornicator and profane. Kind of scary. How many of you know God looks at sin a lot different than most people look at sin? Amen? Profane is from the Hebrew word babelos, and this term literally means something or someone who is unhallowed. You know what hallowed means? Remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means holy. So unhallowed is unholy. 
So the term profane is the exact opposite of holiness. It's unholy, secular, worldly, as opposed to holy or sacred. And so Esau, when the Holy Spirit literally, through the writer of Hebrews, references Esau as profane, he's saying that Esau was unholy, secular, and worldly. How many of you know that sounds like a lot of backslidden believers have done it? That's why, as believers, we need to be in the Word of God. We need to be living right. Toby quoted a quote, out of the book of Revelation, I believe it was, where he said that the Lord's coming back for a people, and it's out of Revelation, uh, the Lord's seven uh, messages to seven churches of Asia, one of the churches, he goes on and says that the Lord's coming back for a people without spot or blemish, without spot or blemish, amen? Now, how many of you know that's hard to get to without Yeshua, amen? We've got to have his Holy Spirit at work in our life, and we've got to be so plugged into him each and every day. In the biblical context, the term describes a, describes a person who lacks respect for what is sacred. You and I must always respect what is sacred. What is sacred? What is sacred is the things that God sees as sacred. Amen? Your birthright, your inheritance, the word of God, salvation, his spirit that abides in you and has sealed you, those things are sacred before God. Amen. Esau's willingness to trade his birthright for a temporary worldly benefit, a meal, a bowl of lentils. How many of you have ever had a lentils? They're good. I love lentils. But I don't love them enough to trade a birthright for them, let alone a portion. <laughs> Esau's willingness to trade his birthright for a temporary worldly benefit meal demonstrated a lack of regard for the sacredness of his birthright and blessing. If I asked Samuel, Samuel, I want you to trade me your Porsche for that bowl of lentils that you're wanting, and he looked at me, he said, Bruce, have you lost your mind? There's no way that's a fair trade. How many of you know that would have been the right response? Amen. Had Esau really valued what was his through the inheritance of the family, through the word of God, he would have looked at Jacob like Jacob had lost his mind. But he didn't. Esau's birthright was not merely a material or familial privilege, but carried significant spiritual implications in the context of God's covenant promises. Look at all the promises that then came through Jacob. Now, how many of you know you can need to understand God knew that Esau was going to give up his birthright. God knew what was going to happen before it happened, but God didn't make it happen. He just knew it was going to. Do you understand that? And he brought the blessing of God through the lineage of Jacob. Amen? Where, of course, even Messiah himself came. Now, as we come in for a landing, the Holy Spirit uses Esau's example as a warning against spiritual indifference and dangers of trading eternal blessings for temporary earthly pleasures. And how many of you know the devil does a very good job through television, through media, through distractions, through entertainment, at always trying to whisper momentary pleasure to God's people. And it's so important in these days that you keep yourself holy before God. Amen? That you're not willing to trade anything eternal for momentary sin, amen, for momentary sin. Now, you can look at me and say, well, that's a given, but it's not a given because people do it all the time, all the time, amen, all the time. Esau is portrayed as someone who lived for the moment. You know, isn't that what the world says? Live for the moment, follow your heart. God says, no, your heart's the most deceitful part about you. Most deceitful part about you, don't follow your heart. Don't live for the moment. Live with eternity in mind. Amen? This table's alive. Everybody else is sleeping, I guess. Esau's portrayed as someone who lived for the moment, focusing on a physical desire rather than valuing the spiritual heritage that was his by birth. We're cautioned to not be like Esau, who failed to comprehend and value his spiritual inheritance. Didn't comprehend it. Had he comprehended it, he would not have ever sold it for a bowl of beans. If you and I could ever comprehend 
the inheritance the Lord has given to us, you would not be willing to sell it ever. I would not be willing to sell it ever for a momentary pleasure. Someone say amen. amen. The following speak of the believer's spiritual inheritance. I'm going to go through this real quick. We've got three minutes here. It's important to encouraging believers to value it in contrast to Esau's disregard for his birthright. So these are some of the promises real quick. In him, in Messiah, we also were chosen, predestined according to his plan. Everybody say his plan. He keeps working out all things according to the purpose of his will so that we who were first to put our hope in Messiah might be for his glorious praise in him. You also, after you heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, and after you believed in him, were sealed with the promise, Ruach HaKodesh, the promised Holy Spirit. He is the guarantee of our what? It's the Spirit of God who guarantees your inheritance until the redemption of his possession. In other words, until God takes you as possession eternally, the Holy Spirit has sealed you and promised you to his glorious praise. Amen? 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4, Praise be the God and the Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. In his great mercy he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah from the dead to a what? Inheritance. Everybody say Inheritance. An inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, unfading, reserved in heaven for you. Why would we trade that for something worse than a bowl of beans? Why would we trade that for a moment's sin or a moment of worldly pleasure? Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father who qualifies you to share in the inheritance of the Kedoshim, the saints in the light. Again, you and I have been qualified through Yeshua Messiah to share in that inheritance. You need to understand you have an eternal inheritance. Don't sell it out. Romans 8, 16, 17, the spirit, the Ruach himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For this reason, Hebrews 9.15, he, Yeshua, is the mediator of a new covenant in order that those called may receive the promised eternal what? And that inheritance is eternal. Everybody say eternal. What's eternal mean? Forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen? Since a death has taken place that redeems them from violations under the first covenant. So again, we have received the promised eternal inheritance. Don't sell your birthright. Don't let the devil talk you out of your birthright. You tell him, no way am I going to trade the inheritance God's given me for anything that this world has to offer. Amen? Good preaching, Pastor. All right. We're done, guys. Hallelujah. So if y'all would go ahead and put it on the Hamosi, please.